Welcome to the Leadership Roundtable, a podcast with Dr. Conway Edwards. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic, and <laughs> awesome. I am honored that we get to talk today, especially because of the topic we're talking right. about, which is very revealing. Mm. And so no matter, no matter how you try to cover up your leadership, our talk today will reveal your motive mm. and why you do what you do. It's extraordinarily self-reflective. So I'm excited about it. It's going to be really good. Um, we're going to talk about <laughs> why you lead, why you do what you do, and really digging in. And I um, want to encourage you to go to our webpage to visit 1cc.com slash leadership roundtable. You're going to find some great resources there, and you can see some of our past podcasts and show notes, and then also a great resource that um, you're going to you're going to learn as we go through this talk today is a book called The Motive. Um, and we'll discuss some of the things from that book as well that's really impacted and shaped our leadership. So the, the whole topic is, 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 is why are you leading? That's it. And um, is it the same as why you initially started leading? Has it changed? Has it shifted? And um, there's a whole lot of reasons, and I don't know what yours is, but you just need to pause and reflect on why am I even doing what I'm doing? That's really good. That's wow. really, really good. I'm doing. The reason for that is because so often uh, your mm. leadership shifts mm. as you're going on this journey of leadership, and you need to always ask yourself, mm. am I still doing it for the right reasons? Most mm. leaders, when they start out, they're doing it because, you know, they, they have a call from God to do this, or they feel that this is their gift mix, and they want to make a difference, and they care about people, and they want to make a difference in the lives of people. But as you go through the ups and downs of leadership, if you're not careful, your heart can begin to shift. And if you <laughs> don't realize it, you could have started for one thing, and now you end up doing it for another reason. So that's mm. one of the reasons why we want to talk about it. It's been very instructive for us, and I think it's very instructive for people that lead under you. And so volunteers that you have leading, maybe in a corporate sense, you have individuals that uh, you're leading and they're leading others. It's a great discussion to have around. Why are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And there are five things, five questions, five things we want you to process that really will help you discern whether you're doing it for reward or whether you're doing it for responsibility. And Patrick on. Lincioni has given us a great work that I would highly recommend you and your team go through as well. And we'll give you our design of what that looks like, but it's all coming from his book, The Motive. Right. And Patrick is a dear friend, and I think you and your team will be extraordinarily um, benefited if you use this resource uh, at all levels of leadership within the organization. Yeah. So you should take a look at it, and you should process it as well. All right? Let's jump in, Matt. What, what yeah. do you mean by reward and responsibility? Well, t tell me yeah. your thoughts on that first before we even go any further. They're, two, they're yep. on the different continuums. Yes. So on the one side, you have reward. On the other side, you have mm -hmm. responsibility. Uh, tell me a little bit about what your take was on those. Yeah, things. I think the way it really the way it really hit home for me is to think if you're a sports fan, is when athletes get a big contract. Mm. Um, they've had a few good years. They get a big contract. Um, they either view that contract of one of two ways: either I got this contract as a reward for how good I've been doing, or I got this contract as a responsibility for what's expected of me in the future. No, that's really good. And that's what this is. That's what this talk is all about. Is when you lead, how are you viewing your leadership? Is it based on reward, or is it based on responsibility? Is it is it based on what what I'm getting because of what I've done, or maybe mm -hmm. I've climbed my way up the ladder, mm -hmm. or am I leading because of the responsibility that I have to invest and pour into others? Yeah, no, that's really good. What's 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 driving you? What's the what's the word that drives and helps you make all your decisions? Is it, I'm doing this because of a call? I'm doing this because of the love of people? I'm doing this because of what's in it for me? Right. I'm doing it because I want to use this as an opportunity to go to the next level. And so I'm just doing it to get to the next level. I'm using it as a stepping stone to move from here to the next job, the next church, the next corporate position that I might be able to get. Is that really why you're doing it? And so this will really help you to discern why you do what you do. So let's jump in and talk about these these five things. And boy, I tell you what, they sting me and they should sting you because they are right on the money. 
and I think you'll oh. you'll deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate it. All right. Okay. So so let's jump in. What's the first one? Five questions or five topics to talk about that will reveal what kind of leadership and what your motive might be. Number one mm -hmm. is the ability to have difficult conversations. My, 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 my. Uh, oh. So here's the problem. Uh, nobody teaches us at home, oftentimes, how to have good conflict. Nobody teaches us at school how to have good conflicts. They expect you to just make it while you go. And yet still, when it comes to the church world, uh, conflict is inevitable. Any kind of great organization has to have conflict. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't like to have the difficult conversation, then you naturally are creating an unhealthy organization. And if you don't like to have it, it usually means you prefer peace than you prefer getting to the ultimate issue so that the organization can go further faster. So it becomes critical, if you're a good leader, it becomes critical for you not to relish them, but to know how high the stakes are if you don't lovingly confront, if you don't, if you don't lovingly care for the person so that you can have these difficult conversations. And if you don't like to have them, it means you're on the reward side. I, I, I would prefer being safe than for the organization to be healthy. I would prefer not offending my friends than for us to create a healthy path moving forward. I would prefer making sure that nobody is offended than making sure that our organization is achieving its goals. That's what's at stake. And yet still, if you're a people person and you love people, then you don't want to offend people. And now you're mixing up leadership and friendship, and you allow friendship to trump leadership. And therein lies where organizations are held back. Churches mm. uh, begin to create silos, and people like one person over another because one might be more conf confrontational, and then they don't like to talk to or hang out with that person. And the other one that's friendly, meaning they don't deal with any issues, but they're just fun to be around and so you've got to be able to deal with those difficult conversations pastor Come matt talks so to me. i want to ask that you a question mean? yeah I, let's go i want to ask go. you about that because mm -hmm. there's some people who naturally they just when a storm's coming i'm going right into the storm correct um and it could be a little too extreme sometimes but it could be right on there's some who are a little bit more passive based on their personality style mm -hmm. what do you how would you encourage somebody who normally doesn't go into the difficult conversations how what, how can they work themselves into those conversations That's to be good. successful in those? So, number one, I think you have to remember the stakes. You have to remember how high the stakes are. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't want to confront that person, what you're saying is you would much rather not have clarity. Yeah. You'd much rather allow there to be ambiguity and drama, which means the whole church, the whole organization slows down or goes in an unhealthy way than if you just have a difficult conversation and confront somebody. So the first thing you have to remember is how high the stakes are. The second thing you have to remember is that love really means dealing with the issue and not hoping that somebody else deals with it. If, you love, if you're going to love your brother and sisters in Christ, then love actually loves having the difficult conversation. They might not right. love it, but they, they know that if I really love you, I need to be able to have this conversation with you. And so they will not allow fear. They will not allow um, uncertainty or they will not allow the environment to be cloudy and therefore have no clarity. So number one, I think you should make sure you know the motive and your reason and know how high the stakes are. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think you need to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you love them, then you want to have that conversation. And then thirdly, mm -hmm. you need to have somebody hold you accountable to make sure that, okay, you're going to have this conversation by mm -hmm. Friday at 5 o'clock or else I'm going to bring you all two together. <laughs> and that kind of accountability and deadline really will begin to help you to see the benefit of that. Right. And so one of the things I think you have to do is just learn the art over time of walking into those dark places knowing that the light of Jesus Christ is with you. That's good. What I've learned from a lot of experience is um, when you avoid the difficult conversations, mm -hmm. those situations – almost never work themselves out yeah. oh. um you Woo. can you can pray about it you can yeah. do, it, it's it's almost never <laughs> there's one in a million times where it's going to accidentally work its way out right but left alone on neutral those things will only get worse and yeah. the conversation only get harder that's correct so everything pastor conway said huge 
being able to have the difficult conversation. Number two. Well, 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 hold on. Before you leave that one. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you, uh, if you don't want to have them, you're doing it. Your only reason you don't have them is because you want to self-protect. The only reason you don't want to have it mm. is because you're trying to look good oh. in the picture or you're trying to say it's not that big a deal. And here's what happens. It's going to blow up when you least expect it. When you least can afford for it to blow mm -hmm. up, it's going to blow up. And it's going to blow up in <laughs> such a way that's going to magnify the problem. When you could have dealt with it as a small situation, now it's gotten so big that the end is going to be devastating to you and everybody associated with you. So please learn the art as a leader. Yeah. Own the responsibility as a leader to have the difficult conversation. Do it in love. Find out when it's the best time for the person to have the conversation. But you've got to do it and not yeah. allow the enemy to take something that was really tiny and make it so big that it has the, 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 the risk of hurting the entire ministry, the entire church, because you didn't want to have a hard yeah. conversation. I mean, All right, I think I, I like to say that every small problem wants to grow up to be a big problem. Uh, every time. And um, I also want to move off of this point because sometimes I wonder if you're talking to me to the <laughs> listeners. So we're going to go ahead and go over to number two. Um, <laughs> that's okay. There's a little convicting there. Number two yeah. is how well you're able to manage subordinates. How well you're able to manage those mm -hmm. you lead, managing subordinates. So, talk to us about that. All right, managing subordinates mean if you're gonna if you're a good leader and you're gonna manage your the people under you, your job is to provide clarity. The way you provide clarity is by coming up with the priorities for that week, for that month, for that year, and then holding them accountable to those priorities, to those um, goals that you have set up with them. Now. Uh, some people love doing this because they're natural managers. They enjoy setting the priorities and then saying, every Friday I'm going to check in with you to see how you're doing. Right? Some people enjoy. But some people don't like it at all. They just think you're grown. You should be able to manage yourself. So do the work that you know you're supposed to do. Nobody should have to micromanage you. Come over your back and see what's going on. But if you care about the organization moving forward, if you care about the ministry, if you care about your ushers moving forward, your greeters moving forward, your parking lot team, your kids ministry, your student ministry moving forward, if you care about any of those, then you've got to set up rhythms where you are consistently cl being clear on what's important right now, priorities, and then checking up to see if people are doing what they said they were going to do. This is huge for any leader and any manager if you're going to move the ball forward. And too often, especially in churches, because you're not driven by quarterly results, you're not driven by Wall Street, you just think, hey, man, we're one big happy family. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if we get things done or not. But that means you're not effective. That means you're not committed to excellence. That means you're not being a good steward of the ability and the gifts that God has given to us. So our job as leaders is to ask, what are our priorities this week? I did this this morning with our team. And then who is going to get it done? And then by when? And then you follow up with that in a week or in a two weeks. That's what managing subordinates mean, and that's what they do. Mm -hmm. Your goal then is, how good am I at that? Is there a weekly rhythm, of a, every two weeks rhythm, where I'm talking to my team and finding out from each direct report, each volunteer leader, hey, here's what I asked you to do. How did we do on that? Yeah. Pastor Matt, what, what do you think? What, do you th um, <clears throat> what is the tension there between leadership and management? Mm -hmm. So there's uh, uh -huh. there's been a move away from managing and management that we need to be leaders and better yep. leaders. So how, what, what does it look like to live in that tension for you? Well, um, um, the saying goes, <clears throat> leaders do the right things. Managers do things right. Leaders do the right. They know what those priorities are, and they're doing it because they know at the end of the day, they have this goal to achieve, and they've got to divide it up into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. Managers do things right. They make sure that the people are supposed to be doing their job so that everybody can get it done, their part, so that the ultimate goal gets done. Managers do uh, things right. So 
there's a balance between the two because you've got to know what the priorities are. So you got to know what the right things to do are. And then manager says, how do we make sure that everybody's being held accountable to doing those things? So this is this is on the side. It leans toward the management management side. But if you're going to lead for responsibility, you ultimately have to get the goal done for churches. We got to win people to Christ and grow mm-hmm. people up in Christ. So that's that. That's one of the big things. You got to go make disciples of all nations. If you're going to do that, that means your job then it is to make sure that you're holding them accountable based on the priorities you give them. Some leaders just hate it, and if you do, that means what you're suggesting is this is revealing to you mm-hmm. that you want you're on the side of reward, you're not on the side of responsibility. Mm-hmm. You're on the side of. Um, I just want to do my part, and I'm grown. They should do their part. You, and then then if you're on the side of responsibility, you're saying, I own the fact that God has graciously given me these people to lead, and it's my job to make sure they're healthy, to make sure they're accomplishing what they and what we set out to do. That's good. So that's number two. Number two. All right, number three. So number one was having difficult conversations. Number two was how well you can manage your subordinates. Number three is running great team meetings. Now, I think it's important for you to define what a great team meeting is. Running great team meetings because sometimes I think I just had a great meeting. (laughs) Uh, But it might not have been a great meeting. So what does it mean to run a great team meeting? Yeah. So great team meetings mean that, number one, you're adding value to people on your team. You're coming in and you're adding value to them. Maybe you teach them one thought, Mm -hmm. something new that they've never heard before that will add value to them. Maybe in their personal lives, maybe in their spiritual lives, maybe in their leadership lives, maybe in their parental lives. But at some level, you're adding value to them. In other words, they are a better leader after your meeting than they were before they showed up. Number two, you're investigating. You're trying to figure out where people are on the process and what's holding them back from accomplishing their goals. Is there anything you can do to remove hindrances so that they can have a smooth pass to run forward? Number three, you're looking for just a sense of what are the priorities now and how do we accomplish them? So you're making it clear what each person in that meeting sh- should be holding as their priority and what are we asking them to do. Those are some of the things you need if you're going to have a great meeting. If you're going to have a great meeting in a spiritual sense, there should be a spiritual tone to it. Mm-hmm. And there should be, whether it is a prayer time, just to make sure everybody is centered appropriately. But there has to be a spiritual side to that, I believe, if you're going to have a, a healthy and effective meeting. Then, if it, if it needs to be if it's if it's a longer meeting like a retreat or if it's a shorter meeting like it's a it's a it's a 15 minute check in meeting then you need to know which meeting you're going into so that you can lead them well so there's some for 15 minutes there's some for an hour there might be a 2 hour meeting it shouldn't be longer than that and there's a retreat where we go off to deal really tackle long term issues mm-hmm. but you need to know what meeting you're going into and then you need to know what are the four or five things that creates healthy meetings so that they can they can charge ahead with the issue, however, is if you don't like to have meetings, <laughs> then you're doing it for you, reward, and not for responsibility. Mm-hmm. Meetings are what leaders do to move the ball forward. It just is. Mm-hmm. So leaders, if you are if you say, I hate meetings, then I don't know how you can be a leader. I just don't. Because how else do you find out? What's important? How else do you set vision? How else do you clarify priorities? How else do you make sure you hold people accountable? How else do you make sure we're getting done what we're set out to do? And a lot of that is meetings, which is why you have to have it. So whenever a leader comes in, well, I just think we meet too much and we have too many meetings. They might be right if the meetings are too long, boring, ineffective, <laughs> nobody gets valued, then yes, I would agree with you. But if it's if it's intentional, <laughs> if it's directional, if it's focused, if it's fast, space, then I think meetings are critical to a healthy and effective organization. Ooh. Pastor Matt, I see you're laughing a whole lot. What are you thinking I'm about that I'm laughing a whole lot because I got, I got five M's. You haven't heard these M's. All you right, let's hear I think it. you've heard these M's. Okay, let's hear it. But let's I think the acronym we should go is more meetings mean more momentum. Ooh, that's good. More meetings mean more momentum. Let's do it. I love so it. So we've got to have that. Um, what do you say? You, you well, more good meetings 
right. mean more. If they're not boring. If That's correct. If they're not focus less. That's correct. That's um, correct. So that the key elements you said are so good. It's, it's providing clarity. It's adding value. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's giving goals and priorities. For those listening that meetings are a drag or um, you hear people say they don't like your meetings, mm. these are the elements you need to outline for your meetings to Excellent. go well. Excellent. People should come out of your meetings. It should be like we just broke the huddle and now we're ready to go run the play. That's it. It shouldn't be like that. In addition that. to that, by the way, if you want to know any more about this, just go pick up our book. We have a book uh, called 2080 uh, Rule uh, that we wrote, and you can go pick it up on Amazon or any way you can find that. It has it details oh. uh, the eight things that are critical to every healthy meeting, and you can find it there. I think it would be a good resource for you. Good. All right? Okay. Number four. So we've been through the first three. Number four is developing the leadership team. That's it. So one of the ways you know if your reward or responsibility is how well you develop the leadership team. Absolutely. That's the leader's number one job, I believe. After you provide clarity and clear direction, your team should know that when they're around you, they're going to be better leaders. So there are two things you have to do for that. One is leaders always know people always come, people always go, people get sick, people get hurt. And so because of that, they always have a leadership pipeline. You always have a group of yep. apprentices, of, of individuals that are ready to take on somebody's assignment if somebody has to sit on the bench for a while. So because of that, we've got to make sure we're, um, we have a leadership pipeline. Number two, then, you've got to make sure you're developing this team. What is your curriculum to make sure that this team is getting better? Mm -hmm. How are you? They came to you. God has uniquely allowed them to be in your environment. How are you now adding value to them so that they're being better leaders? How How are you maximizing their gifts and abilities so that they are the best leaders that they could ever be? How do you make sure at the end of the day they're looking back and saying, Thank you so very much for all that you have done to help me be the best I can be. That's what they should be saying about you because of your willing and commit willingness and commitment to invest in each of the leaders around you. That's what I think it is, man. That's so good. I heard John Maxwell say that um, if we want to know how good a leader's doing, you shouldn't look at how the leader's doing. You should look at those who he leads and how they're doing. Because as the leader, if you're doing good, that's all good. But the really way, the way you know you're doing well is how well, how successful, like Pastor Conway said earlier, are you removing obstacles? How well yeah. are the people under you leading? How well are you really transferring what God's gifted you with in the gift of Woo. leadership? So develop, develop, develop. What are what are a couple of different tools or ways that you develop leaders? I know you said have your your pipeline, have your curriculum, or what you're going to use. What other ways would you encourage? Well, we just gave our leadership team, you know, the top three or four books that we suggested that they be reading and has to read before the end of the year. Number one is the Three Kings. All right, you got to read that because it helps you understand authority issues. Number two is uh, Maxwell's classic work of uh, developing the leader within you, developing the leaders around around you. Mm-hmm. Another one that he wrote that I think is a genius book is the idea of winning with people. If you can't if you can't understand people, then how are you going to lead them? Right. So winning with people is a critical work I believe that um, that everybody should read just to get you started on your leadership journey. Mm-hmm. We've got some other classic, but those four, I think you're well on your way. And if you haven't read those four, you need to start right now reading those four books and shameless plug, why wouldn't you read uh, 2080 rule, which I think is one of the best out there. Uh, some dude called Conway. Yeah, it's okay. It. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> but you do want to go check out that book, the 2080 rule, because it's going to, everything we talk about when, mm-hmm. when people at our church read the book, um, they're like, oh my gosh, that's what we do. Um, everything in that book is really, it's very, it, it's, it's what we do here. It's not Absolutely. some idea we've cooked up of something we hope would work. It's what's in practice here at our church. So we would encourage you to check that out. Um, Phenomenal book, the 2080. Um, Now, number five. We've got one more. One more. One more way to know if your reward or responsibility. Here it is. Number five is constantly communicating, constantly communicating to employees. My gosh, I tell you what, this, I struggle with this one the most because I don't like repeating myself a whole lot. So if I say it one time, I think everybody gets it and you're done, right? But if you're not tired of saying it, I mean, everybody already knows this. This is so redundant. If you don't feel that way when you're about to communicate vision, when you're about to communicate direction, then I'm just telling you, you haven't communicated it enough. We, we think that because we say it one time, 
then it's gold and everybody has received it. It's it's imprinted on their hearts and they're ready to go. Well, how many things have you heard somebody else say and you have written it on your heart? Very, right. very few. So that's why we have to over, 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 over communicate <laughs> so that everybody knows it's second nature. This one I despise, but it's the truth. I'm leaning toward reward and not responsibility because I selfishly think just because I don't want to hear it again, I think everybody right. has gotten it already. I think that they don't need to hear it. And I'm oftentimes, if not 100% of the time, absolutely wrong. So if you care more about your people getting what's important than you being tired of saying the same thing, then you have to begin the process of saying to yourself, I've got to say it a hundred more times so that it gets seeped in to our culture. Pastor Matt, what do you You should thinking? be saying it so many times that your team, your people – um, could have fun imitating how many times you say that's that. That's good. That's good. They, that's they good. should imitate you because yep. you say it so much. They're so used to hearing it. Right. So all of a sudden it becomes a broken record um, inside of them. So um, we've got our five different things we've talked about, about yep. how do you know if you're reward-based, if you're responsibility-based. That's good. Um, I want to review those five for you for just a moment. Number one is um, – you like to have, or you can have manage. You can difficult have difficult times. conversations. Mm-hmm. Number two, managing subordinates. Number three, running great team meetings. Number four, developing a leadership team. And number five is communicating constantly to employees. Now, as you evaluate yourself on these, if somebody's listening and they say, "You know what? I've discovered that I might be leaning. I didn't start this way, but I'm leaning towards the reward side of leadership." How does that movie play forward? That's good. So then I think you need to I think you need to take a day and I think you need to spend some time with God. I think you need to ask the question, why why don't I like to do these things? Mm-hmm. Why are these things so difficult for me? And I think you need to do a heart check. And I think you need to ask God to help you with your own heart and to turn it around so that you're working not for your kingdom, but for his. Mm-hmm. Not to build your name, but his. And I think whenever you lean toward reward, it's because your heart's moving away from the mission and it's moving to the man or the woman and you're prioritizing yourself over the team. And so I think it's a it's a confession that needs to take place so that we can move toward um, uh, what I call ultimate mission. I think you have to start with confession to get there. So what I'd recommend is you just spending some time with God, maybe spending some time with a counselor, asking that counselor, hey, can you help me process some of this, please? Because I just don't like the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing anymore. And I need to get a renewed lease on life because this is not where I started. Mm-hmm. And I need to get, I need to rekindle Revelation chapter 2. says you ought to. It's not that Revelation chapter 2, talking to the church at Ephesus, he says, it's not that you don't love me. Is that I'm not your first love. And your assignment is to make sure that Christ is your first love so that you're, f- you're flowing and you're working out of an overflow of your relationship with Christ. When you do that, then you know I can't not have a, a difficult conversation because mm-hmm. I have to have it because the mission of Christ is too great. Mm-hmm. Then I know I have to set clear priorities because if I don't, then the mission is at stake. Then I know I have to have great meetings because if I don't, then I'm I'm leaving it up to chance. Then I know I have to develop the leadership team because if I don't, then we're not going to be the best we can be for the glory of God. And then I have to over communicate because if I don't over communicate, then the mission will get lost and other things will begin to be priorities. So I hope this helps because I think if you really use this tool consistently, it will remind you to come back to true north where Jesus Christ is the center of it all. That's right. It's a What's very it? slow drift. And mm-hmm. I think naturally in our flesh, we drift towards reward. Yeah. And we have to regularly come back to the responsibility and the call that God's given us. So um, we want to encourage you to go check out the 2080 rule. Yeah. Also, the motive by Patrick Lencioni, great resources and tools to evaluate your leadership and Please go download what we have. That's We've right. got it in our show notes at visit1cc.com slash leadership roundtable. This is something that you can do and walk yourself through it and then share it with others. Walk your team through this as well. Yep. 
That's what's, that's a part of developing the leadership team. That's it. So please visit our webpage. You can download the resources so that you can uh, follow along with yourself and also share with your team and take them through this. You can do that at visit1cc.com slash leadership roundtable. Thank you again for joining us. We are so grateful that you've been here with us today. Love it. It's we will see you next month. God bless you. We'll see you next time.